¿Utopía o distopía? Vamos a ser nosotros, vosotras, las que... You and us are the ones that are in charge of our lives. Is that so? Or is something or somebody going to direct our lives? This is possibly one of the most important things that we need to ask when we think about our work in the future. I personally, when I think about these things, I'm very hopeful, I'm very enthusiastic. I think there's a great future ahead of us. I think technology is going to do some very important things. We're going to see people who are disabled who are going to be having improved lives. And that's going to be thanks to technology. Technology is going to help us to live better. I have no doubt about that. And it's also true that those that think of technology, uh, think of them as it's an evil. People think that robots are evil. We see that. We know people think that that's what's going to technology going to do, but we need to take an initial approach, which is to think about where we want to head. And this first uh, thought should be something that guides us to a key, a key goal, which is progress at the end of the day. Progress which isn't economy-centered or economic growth-centered, which is very important, but it shouldn't be an ultimate aim. It's not our goal, not the goal for society. Our goal should be progress progress for society as a whole, for all of society. And when I talk about progress for all, what I mean is that we need to go about things differently. We need to invest in education. We need to invest in health. We need to invest in uh, social policies, sustainability. And of course, we need to invest in the skill to innovate. And I'm going to talk about the skill to innovate because We're going to be talking about other areas, such as improvements and sustainability, in other moments during the conference. But when I talk about progress, which is something which is vital for all of us, what's most important, and that was said by our president, the Linda Kare, what's most important is the human face, the human dimension. We need to be able to train people to lead so that they can lead their own lives and society's lives in general. It's the human side of things, something that we need to beginning, we need to think about right from the beginning with a lot of technology, good technology, and with a great deal of progress in science, because it's true that the culture of the future, if you look at what we see, what we read, what we hear, is going to be based on science and technology. We know that. But what's going to be important as well is that we know how to balance that with humanities, technology and humanities as a balance, so that our future truly is something that is progress, progress as society, the whole of society. There are always uncertainties. Any sort of change or transformation generates uncertainty and complexity. And that's taking us to difficult environments, because we always think of the worst, the worst case scenario. People start thinking about millions of jobs disappearing. We always think about that. Everybody thinks that the change is going to be appalling. And yet, actually, what you can see here is the fact that human beings have always been able to adapt the way they innovate. Look at how they're working there. This is innovative adaptation. This is what we call survival 4.0. It's always existed in human beings, always. And you can see it in the video. And when I talk about adaptive innovation, that leads to resistance. And resistance is a human characteristic in our ability to overcome difficulties in life, adaptive innovation. That's what's important. We need to have the skill to imagine. We need to be creative. We need to be intuitive, emotion, heart. We need the skill to improvise. Robots are never going to be better at that than we are. And that's where we need to work. We need to work so that people can strengthen those skills that are so important. Because you can see, you can see what's happening. Imagine robots replacing those sort of things. They still exist today, now. In the 21st century, they still exist. And th maybe they will be replaced partly, but I'm sure we'll be able to imagine other things to carry on working. Because this uncertainty, this uh, complexity, when people say that so many jobs are going to disappear, of course they're going to disappear. That's happened throughout the whole of mankind's history. But we also know that many of the jobs will change. The ones that exist today will just be different. So we're going to need people that have different skill sets. It's so important. And then you saw in the video that millions of 
new jobs are going to be created. Some of us don't even know what those jobs are going to be, but they are going to be created. It doesn't matter. Let's prepare people so that they can work in those jobs. So from this viewpoint, I personally am I'm very optimistic. I think we've got not just a hopeful future ahead of us, but a promising, a bright future. We're working and we're progressing towards a smart future, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not. It's, it's not going to come. It's not just around the corner. It's already here. And that's actually one of the major problems. We're already existing this new reality in our daily lives. Sometimes we don't realize that, that this intelligence is coming into all the things that we do in many of the things we do in our lives today, not just our professional lives, our personal lives. We're, it's unstoppable. So let's make use of the fact that it could be uh, very positive so that we can design things so that everything goes well because we are writing the future now in the present. Of course, our productive fabric is going to change. There'll be complete different context for jobs, but also we'll be changing our training and education systems, and we need to become about. We need to change these education systems without getting worried about it. We shouldn't be too fast, nor do we want to be worried. Just carry on slowly but surely. We have set out so that 2025 vocational education and training in the Basque Country should be fully prepared so that we can face all those transformations and changes. And that's what we'll be doing in the next years. But VET, within this smart world, needs to have not just intelligence, but practical intelligence. Practical intelligence, yes, why do I mean that? Because what is VET? Exactly what is VET? Well, there's knowledge in VET, but it's also a matter of skills as well. And these skills are important. And these and the population is going to need these skills and the knowledge and the capacities that VET can get across to those people who come and study at VET schools. That's very important. It's important to know that VET needs to accept getting this intelligence across. It, VET needs to respond to new goals, use new methods, and what's also very important, implement new organizational models. I'm going to explain shortly how our VET schools are being organized in a different way, because a static system is never going to operate in a changing environment. What's more, a changing, a very fast changing environment. We need to be prepared to do so, and that's what we're doing. Progress that I mentioned earlier isn't just a matter of improving what already exists. No, it means that we need to make progress towards what will be. It's the added value of the things that we need to concentrate on. We need to go to choose which road to follow because that's the road that we think progress will follow. And that road, that where we're going, is something that, that two or more, or many people have to do, because there's no idea in the history of mankind that can give us an idea with what's going to happen in the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And that's forcing us to work hard, make tremendous efforts in what we call innovation processes, and that's what we're doing. Work truly in innovation, because then we're going to have to move on to intelligence. And you can't go to intelligence from zero. You need to go from innovation. And that will mean that we'll come across people who have different ways of seeing things. Even there might be tension. There might be stress between people. But we need to see how able we are to find harmony. It's a great world. I love harmony. Nobody uses the word harmony. I love harmony. Harmony and complexity. That is, we need to overcome innovation via cooperation, sometimes cooperation between very, very different people. Not between different people, of course, that as well, but between people with different opinions. Because some people see things some way and other people see things other way. That's where we need to start to think about innovation. It's this context has meant that Life in general is always uh, defined by uh, our opposites, like light and darkness, tall people, short people, or elderly people, young people. We always talk about things 
in relation to the opposite. We do that at work as well. Some people see things in some way, other people see things differently. So there are two options. We can argue and see who wins the fight, or try together to see what points we have in common and start building on those points down the route to using complexity. So we're working in VET on innovation. There are 82 VET schools working on applied innovation. That means over 2,000 teachers that are directly uh, trained to work in our Applied Innovation Center. And so thanks to you, thanks to, thanks to them, thanks to their work. All of these people have been working on a concept which has a strategy. And this strategy in the Basque Country is based in the Basque Country here, of course, on four principles, the complexity of managing, the value of balance, the challenge of decisions, and the control of time. These are four elements. If you take the first of them, which is management complexity, what it tells us is how we manage contradictions, because we always come across contradictions. Of course we do. How can we manage contradictions? And those of you that are uh, centre directors, you know that there are complex problems to manage, for example, when you all professors and teachers come together. We know that. Because people have different viewpoints, but how can we manage these contradictions and these tensions? Something that we've been doing ever since we started working on innovation in 2004. From then onwards, especially from the year 2013 onwards, we've been working on that. And then you've got this principle of uh, the value of balance, because there's a clash between the creative people and those that we call continu continuists. Oh, those that want to change, yeah, let's change this, let's transform this. And there are others are saying, no, 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 stop, 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 put the brakes on. There's this clash there. It's an important clash. And it happens a lot. And quite obviously, this balance is necessary. And we need to find this balance in our VET schools. That requires time, patience. All oh, people need to be patient, and we need to find common goals. And that's what we've been doing over recent years then you'll find that there's a diversity and uniformity. We need a lot of diversity, because if you want to get things right, what you need to do is bring together diverse people, because if we bring them together, then we will be innovative. You should never keep uniformity. No, no, it's not somebody at the top there saying, this is the way things should be done. No, 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 no. That's never going to work. It's never going to be innovation. The different approaches that are out there, what we need to do is to see which is the best and what sum of approaches, taking cherry picking uh, the best from each to take us forward. Leadership, of course. There needs to be leadership, not just one person leading. More than one person need to lead. That strikes a balance between two main things. Trust, uh, they need to get the idea of trust, of course, and conviction. Trust, so that people trust the work that people are telling them to do, and conviction, because they need to believe that what is going to be done is what really needs to be done. This is really important. It's not just a question of shouting orders at people. You need to convince people, and you need to get this idea of trust across. So what have we done? Well, we've discussed this a lot, because people say to us, oh, I've got a huge school. It's impossible to innovate in my school. Oh, my school is so small that I don't have sufficient elements to work on innovation. It doesn't matter about size. It's small schools, large schools, and medium-sized schools can all innovate. In the 84 schools where we work, there's a little bit of everything. And I can say out of practice and experience that they all work very well, the small, the medium, and the large. And then another important thing, which is that you need to put your heart into things and a lot of emotion. But beware, because when we get all emotional, sometimes we get a little bit too speedy. And so you need somebody to say, hey, hang on a minute, put the brakes on a little bit, because we need to remember that we need emotion, we need our hearts, but we also need a bit of common sense. Common sense in those decisions that we take and then we put into practice to make the whole system coherent, the whole of the model that we're progressing on in the idea of VET. If we had all of this together, everything that I've just said, you get the magic word, the word that brings us all together, which is cooperation. Cooperation, 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 cooperative networks, cooperative teams.
that if we can cooperate, if teachers cooperate with each other, if different departments cooperate with each other, if we schools cooperate with each other, if there's cooperation between different autonomous communities, between the private sector and uh, the public sector, between private companies and VET centres. And in fact, one of our greatest achievements are here in the Basque Country, what we call collaborative networks. That's what means in the Basque Country things work. Third principle, this challenge of deciding. This is getting a little bit more complicated. Where do I go? What road should I take? That's the problem. That requires a strategy. A strategy, yep, that's it. So what strategy are we going to use? We need a strategy. Our schools need a strategy and, the, and a sufficient independence to have their own strategy and then use the collaborative networks to look at the different strategies that we're using because if we all come together, we'll define a better strategy. Of course, we were. And, but which road should I take? strategy one way or innovation the other way but actually if you look at it the two roads converge they come together we need strategy to be able to take the most important decisions and more importantly always make progress and risk if you don't risk you'll never innovate that's another main principle and the fourth one is time control time control it innovation uh, will be as speedy as it can be it's not as speedy as what somebody wants and sometimes things are at different speeds because of the type of school we're talking about the, the size of that school the way they work their culture so what you need to do is to maintain these different speeds that everybody can the different rates that everybody can innovate at some will be quicker others will be slower but there needs to be some kind of consistency cohesion between the different schools those that go quicker can drive things forward those that go slower can maybe help so we need to come together and we do a great deal of strength because it's not a matter of working on innovation in one VET school or another VET school, no. We work on innovation as a system, the system of VET, which is promoting the field innovation thanks to their VET schools. And from that moment onwards, you get the different speeds for the different people, different horses for different courses. Two years ago, I showed you this video of effect for how things can be effective and how in Formula One in 1950 they changed tyres and uh, how they do it in 2009 and how they did it in 2013. In 2013, it's the same Ferrari, but look at the speed. Look at the speed in 1950, the speed in 2009, 2013, how speed has changed. It's very effective. They're working on being effective. What is effective? It means efficiency, rapid rapidity and precision. We need to work on that in vocational training. Look at 1950, they need more than two minutes. This person that's changing the wheel, he's just bashing it with a hammer. It's incredible, just whacking it with a hammer. Look at it, 2009, how things are a bit quicker, but by 2013, look at that. Speed, the team's ready, they're tense, there's no relaxation there at all. They all look a bit relaxed in 1950s, but not in 2009 or in 2013. That's what I call, I call effectiveness. It's very, very important. What it means is that things have changed over years, but what happens is things have gone even faster now. Formula One's even faster now. Look at what happened this year. This is Mercedes, by the way. Hamilton comes into his box. Wheels change. Next one's in. Bottas in. Look at the precision, which the speed, the effectiveness, and the efficiency of the team. That's the same Ferrari times in 2013. They've beaten the world record in tyre change time. That's what effectivity is. Effectiveness is. I'm going to use a metaphor. The thing is. Technology takes that speed, and it's changing quickly, and that means that we need to be increasingly skilled. The skills of Ferrari in 2013, or the skill of Mercedes this year, 2019, this world record that they've beaten, it, it just seems impossible that they'll be able to improve on that. But because they've got those four concepts, you need to be effective. You need to know what to do and what not to do. That's what strategy is all about, efficiency. 
you know what you've got to do and you need to do it well, as quickly as possible and as precisely as possible. That's what we've just seen in Mercedes with two cars coming in in very, very few seconds. That's what I mean by effectiveness. But we've got to take the leap from applied innovation to active intelligence. As I said earlier, you can't move on to intelligence if you've not been through innovation first. It really is important. And this idea also needs to be defined by smart VET. We need to take that leap. If intelligence is coming, then VET has to be in intelligence. And I said to you earlier, it needs to be practical intelligence. So we're designing intelligent VET. And we're working with these technologies you can see on the screen. In our VET schools, which we haven't yet started working with Connectivity 5.0, Technique is going to start working on Connectivity 5.0 to just decide how we're going to include it in these uh, new technologies, which we've been told are going to change our lives. This immediate connectivity is going to be very necessary for many things in uh, progressing and developing for the future and We've got a great speaker, by the way, coming later, who's going to tell you all about artificial intelligence and what's going to happen in the next years. By the way, last week he was given the National IT Prize, so congratulations to him. So in this context, we're not just worried about technology, we're very worried about technology. We think it's very important, but we're also concerned about sustainability and biosciences. And we've got schools working in these fields. This is these are vital for the future. And we're talking about mm, food, mm, health, healthy aging, circular economy. These are all concepts as well. We're working on all of them. And there, a lot of technology is used, an awful lot of technology. But we need to work with technology, of course we do, but also biosciences and sustainability. The thing is, if you work in these fields, you find that VET schools, even now, even today, and, and, and also in a very short space of time, when we change and when we transform, they're going to have to manage something which is very difficult. That's complexity. And that's why my talk today is titled Managing Complexity, because complexity are at least these 12 different things that our VTE schools are going to have to manage. Some of them already are, some of them aren't. But we are working, as I said earlier, on, in, in, on innovation in 82 uh, schools. But there's a eight uh, out of those 82 where they're changing from the top downwards their whole organization. And they're now becoming smart organizations, intelligent uh, schools. Eight, eight of them that are becoming intelligent uh, VET schools, and there's one thing that we're very worried about, which is how to manage change. That's up there on the board somewhere. How do we manage change? And I say that because I'm going to try to explain a little bit more about this idea, because it's important. What have we done? When we talk about uh, smart schools or high-performance VET schools or future schools, what we've seen is that spaces in their own right, what you call classrooms or offices or... Um, teaching rooms, we all know what I'm talking about when I talk about spaces, these spaces can also be change levers. They need to be changed. We need to organize spaces differently. And we are working to modify spaces. And in this case, we've got what we call high performance spaces. These are these new classrooms that we are, are going to be used for new teaching method methodologies in our VT schools, because here we are developing challenge-based learning. In fact, over 40% of the courses that we teach use this kind of methodology, a methodology in which a classroom is completely different, the methodology which is very, very advanced. We talk about here smart spaces, uh, virtual reality uh, spaces with bits and bobs with machinery in it, because these are virtual reality bits and bobs and teams and pieces of equipment need to be used by our Students will also have what we call STEAM spaces where people uh, can start uh, learning science, technology, engineering, arts, machining, everything. But currently, we are now looking into all of this. Two areas that I'd like to, um, to talk about now, interactive and immersive spaces. What are these interactive and immersive spaces? Well, basically, what they use is applied experimentation. It's a new way of learning by interacting. This is also very important because they're different spaces. They're smart spaces with multi-tactile applications in virtual and augmented reality learning spaces. Uh, 
interactive laser systems, digital transmission teams, and interactive walls. We're designing all of that now. And we know which companies have these kinds of technologies. So we're designing what the classroom of the future is going to look like. We've been able to check on the technology. We're just checking all the different applications. Because at the end of the day, what we want is a new way of learning, a new way of learning by feeling, imagining, experimenting. And if you'll allow me to say it, learn by dreaming, a different way of learning. And that's what our team is working. It's a different way of learning. And that requires different kinds of spaces, different kinds of learning spaces. And when I say you need to take risks, of course you do. You need to trial things. And it looks like things are going to go really well. Those classrooms are going to be great, those immersive interactive classrooms. They're going to be classrooms where you get into different elements. You get into a human body. You can see organs inside a person's body. You can go into an engine and see the engine from inside out. And the whole of that classroom will just be that huge engine or a huge human body. That's what we're going to do. That's what I'm talking about when we talk about immersive spaces. And the idea is to have them as quickly as possible so we can trial them. We're hoping that by the end of this year, we'll have defined that and we'll be able to start trialing those spaces and start thinking about setting them up in VET centers. And of course, if the education department wants it, they might well be interested in having these kind of classrooms in general in schools. So we're talking about spaces, changes, and also different teams, different teams of teachers. We need to forget this idea of departments. Of We need teams, and we need strategy teams, innovation teams, operational teams. Those are the people that make things work. Uh, learning teams, uh, teachers, learning different teaching methodologies, guidance, career guidance teams, and also satisfaction teams, because what we want our, our teachers to be as happy as possible at work. It's very important. We spoke about conviction, trust. Trust and conviction can get, be got across via satisfaction. That's at least the approach that we have, that we take. As I was saying, we are organizing a different kind of VAT school. We have executive management that, that you can see at the top with a management team, the management team on the right in blue. But these eight uh, VET schools already have strategic management, a strategic department, an innovation department that implements all kinds of projects, incremental innovation, disruptive innovation. This department is going to be in charge of very, very new breakthroughs, even. And then innovate and then transfer that information to the rest of our VET schools. It's important to have knowledge transfer. If you look at the diagram, we have a public, a target public, and the target public is all those people that are in our schools, those that work, that are learning, that are students, that are learners, all the teaching staff. Uh, but then we've also got the change driver right in the center. Can you see that in the pink? The change driver. That's the person that's pushing behind, that's driving, that's encouraging people to move. And so we're trying to define these uh, changer drivers. And we're trying to see how we can get people to get involved in change. That requires a lot, a lot of training. Because if you look at the strategy department, strategy departments on the left, we look, we organize strategic uh, meetings. Then, of course, you need to pilot any projects that are invented. That takes you on to the innovation department. Then you move on to the operational department. They need to be all interconnected. There's a flow of inter-area cooperation, inter-departmental cooperation. But this uh, col collaboration flow needs to be driven. People that drive that. If you look at it in a different format, here you can see the teams. The teams are already working. They're looking at creating strategic lines. But we're also, and you can see that, observation, strategic plan, roles, responsibility, tools, and change tools. We need tools to be able to perceive what needs to be changed. And if the VET school thinks that something needs to be changed, then they can just do it. They need to have to to know how to get organized. Well, how do we do all of this? Well, on the left, I think you can see 
the driver, the change driver, I call this person. What that person does is it, he or she monitors the change strategy, they facilitate and assess the results of projects that are implemented, and provide support to all projects that, that imply change, to all three departments, strategy, innovation, and operations. It's this context that we're working on now. In the eight VET schools, we're doing it experimentally. It's applied. It's an applied experimentation to see how we can then transfer all of that to all the VET schools, see what works for our approach. Churchill said, and he was great, success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And it's true, because enthusiasm is what allows us to change and innovate. And in Basque VET, if we have one thing, it's enthusiasm, bucket loads of it. We also have a lot of common sense, although some of the people in my department say, oh, yeah, sometimes you go a bit too far. I'm not looking at anybody here, by the way. Sometimes we do go a little bit too far. Sometimes it's necessary to go too far. What can I say? It's true, but you need to use common sense. But we, we need enthusiasm. And if we've got something amongst our teachers, I always say that, I can never really say sufficient to thank what the teachers, the VET teachers are doing in the Basque Country. And you're gonna see it now in a little video which shows you where VET is in 2019. History shows us that values change when we reassess how we want to live. The future raises the need to redefine the concept of progress. A progress that is not based on improving what is, but on advancing towards what will be. A progress supported by two basic pillars, sustainable human development and social cohesion because this future will not only change what we do, but what we are. A new reality emerges. We need to find a new way of understanding life, and we need to prepare Basque society so that it can comfortably come to terms with these changes. We are going to have to coexist with digitalization, connectivity, smart systems, data, and artificial intelligence. Advances that will also require values that are adapted to a new way of living. Today, robots already interact with machines, with people, and interact among each other. And technology will continue to advance at great speed. Basque Vocational Training is preparing the professionals who are going to provide a response to both the present and the future. And for that purpose, the Basque Country's VT is being transformed again. During recent years, we have worked on the implementation of new learning methodologies, the transformation of the education spaces, the introduction of creative routines in VT centers. And we have also supported our industrial fabric, in particular MSEs, to improve their products and production processes. But it is time for a new impulse that enables us to make the leap from innovation to the new environments of applied intelligence. We no longer live in a world of progressive and predictable changes, but in one of disruptive change. This raises the need for young people to be innovative while they are learning. We have launched an intelligent professional training which responds to the 4.0 different environments, digitalization and connectivity, artificial intelligence and intelligent systems in sectors such as industry, biosciences and health, precision agriculture, gastronomy, automotive or the textile sector, among others, but also that promote and reinforce sustainability inclusion and solidarity. Vocational training centers have always been and will be at the core of the successes of our vocational training, which guarantees its transformation into intelligent organizations, organizations that work towards continuous transformation and which face and provide answers to changes and new challenges. 
centers that have the challenge of expanding and deploying their activities in very different fields. Organizations focused on the future, with ideas to be implemented, with hope and motivation, with capacity for action, which take risks, which work on constant innovation, and which understand that another way of doing things is possible. We design innovative solutions, are quick to implement them and work collaboratively. Knowledge is expanded when it is shared, and sharing is the essence of our project. That's what we do, we share. We're very much aware of the tremendous work that you're all doing here. Really, really very much aware of it. And we're very thankful, truly, for everything that you're doing. Because one thing I need to make clear, of course there's a recipe for success. But I'm going to give you another recipe for success that explains what we do to make things progress. How can we make things successful? Well, what is this recipe for success? There are six ingredients to it. The first ingredient, think. You need to think. Well, think where you want to go. If you don't know where you want to go, it doesn't matter which route you take, because you're never going to get anywhere. You need to be clear about where you want to get. And remember where you want to get, to get there, eventually. Secondly, to know. No, you need knowledge. You need to be prepared, trained. This work that you do every day, the training to be able to achieve the necessary knowledge to progress towards the future, which is where we're heading. And the third ingredient for this recipe is to be able to do things. You need to be able. You need to have the capacity to do things. So we try to help strengthen your independence, help you enthuse about things. You need to be enabled to be able to do things. Fourthly, you need to want to. And that's where your conviction comes into play. We need to always be able to convince you of how important it is to be aware of Futuro. what's coming around the corner, what's in the future, and that we're writing our future now. And we're writing it because we're convinced, and because your work, these changes, however small they may be, are vital for us and for the future. And then doing. If we don't do anything, then you know, might as well forget it. But you can have a lot of knowledge, but if you don't apply it, you might as well not bother. You need to do, not just know. You might be thinking, he said six ingredients, there's only five up there. He's got it wrong, but no. But the most important of those five ingredients that's going to make them into six is trust. The trust, the trust that we have in our department, in our teachers, in our VET schools, in their work, in what we're achieving, the support that we get from private companies, the connection, the consensus that we get from the board of vocational education training, the support of trade unions, the work that we do together. And sometimes we have huge differences, but we always manage to find the solution so that things progress. This is what's important. But if there's something that we do need to be clear on after those six ingredients that really, really, really works, is that the future isn't guaranteed. There's no guarantee. We always talk about the future. The future will come. What future? What future will come? What future's around the corner? It's by no means guaranteed. And why do I say that? Because we're going to have to understand things differently, in, in this case, the present, to live the future. We need to understand the present differently because we're now writing our future, and that's important. And I need to say to you today that without you, and I'm talking here when I say you about the teachers in the Basque Country, we're nothing without you. Nothing, we're just a pretty video. A PowerPoint that's more or less well done. A guy who's not bad at speaking or good presenter, a few the odd good idea. But what we do here is work and explain explain what's being done. And we've heard the European Commission Commissioner, uh, Madame Thiessen. It was an honor to hear what she said. She said that we're one of the best VETs in the world, that we're a benchmark. That's a matter of proud pride, but that's thanks to your work. The only thing I do when I go to Brussels to visit Manuela or Joao or Dana and it's great to go and work with them. We always learn a lot from them. We need more Europe. They know where we will need to go. 
if you and if you don't know where you're going, follow Joao on Twitter. And read what he says. They know where we need to go. And so for that moment onwards, yeah, it's true, Joao. It really is. The European Commission knows where we need to go. We just need to work with them. What the European Commission said needs to encourage us because this success is down to all of you. I'm just the Deputy Minister for however much longer I'm here, but I'm also a teacher just like you. And I will go back to teaching when it's my time. But it's my it's a matter of pride to listen to what you're doing every single day, what you're doing here. Remember that. Be proud. Because truly, for us, you are our backbone. You're the backbone of our future. We need to be aware of that. And we are very, very aware of our responsibility, our accountability towards upcoming generations. Because it's in those future generations where our future lies. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I wish you the very best. See you soon.